I could probably. Um, first of all, thank you so much for visiting with us this evening. I know it's a busy time. Uh, we are hopeful um, that the presentation we provide tonight um, will help you as well as the recordings that we make uh, that we'll be able to share with others who are not able to come tonight. Um, so we very much appreciate your time um, and we have some great information to provide. But before we do that, I want to introduce our team um, to you. On the far end is Amanda Trimble. She's our coordinator of, of special programs. Seated next to her is Kaylee Brown. She is our coordinator of special education. While the two of them aren't presenting tonight, they will present in the future, um, and they're part of our team. Um, presenting tonight um, next to Kaylee is Allie Chance. She's our director of special education. Next to her is our esteemed principal from Sugar Grove Elementary School, Jesse Hyde. To her right is Marcy Shostak. She is our elementary director of teaching and learning. To her right is our secondary director of teaching and learning, um, Shannon Carol Fry. And I don't know if I said this, but I'm Jack Parker. I serve as assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. Um, so thank you so much for your time tonight. Um, our overview, as you can see from tonight, is we're gonna talk about what is currently impacting your child's classroom and some of the things that we've been working on in the last couple of years, as well as how are we working to ensure that all students are learning at high levels. That's our new mission, um, for all students to learn at high levels. And um, how are we supporting that social emotional, the social emotional needs of our students? So we'll spend some time talking about our um, program that is mostly in elementary school, trust-based relational intervention. So we hope you enjoy the time. We will have an opportunity for feedback at the end via a survey. If you would like to do that, if you have your phone or something, you'll be able to use that at the end and I'll give you the link. We'll also stay after for questions and you're hap uh, welcome uh, to ask us questions. We'd be happy to spend some time chatting with you if you have any questions at the end, okay? So, without further ado, um, I believe Shannon Carol Fry is up to bat. That's not a good sign, is it? All right. Well, thank you, as Jack said. Um, thank you for coming to spend some time with us. I know we had, to, was anybody at the sixth grade choir concert already today? I'm gonna bet, we may have a few people that will come in. We've had, we have quite a few events, obviously, in our, in our district, so. I have the opportunity to speak to you about professional learning communities and specifically what's impacting your child's classroom. And 
In order to do that, I've structured my time around these four elements. And these four elements come from um, the late Richard Dufour, who's really the founder of PLCs. And he says that the very essence of a learning community is a focus on and a commitment to the learning of each student. In his book, Building a PLC at Work, he says that there are four interconnected factors that determine the capacity of a learning community, and they are the four that I have in front of you, new structures and procedures, improved communication, enhanced teacher learning, and collective ownership and intelligence. Collectively, those are the structures that are impacting your child's classroom. So let's take a look at them. One new structure that we put in place in Center Grove is dedicated time for PLC teams to meet. All teachers in Center Grove are members of a PLC. I've pictured a few teams to show that every level and every subject is included. Teams are arranged around grade levels, courses, departments, and in most situations, team members serve the same students. All PLC teams have access to meeting time during early release on Wednesday afternoons. The work of PLCs takes time, and Center Grove has made the commitment to set aside time during the work day for this important work. So that's an important structure that we've made a change. Improved communication was another factor that I mentioned improves capacity for a professional learning community. Our PLC teams have improved communication because they collaborate around four key questions. What do we want our students or our kids to know and be able to do? How do we know when they've learned it? And then, how do we respond when they do not know it? And how do we respond when they do know it? As a result of focusing on these questions, our PLCs spend time getting crystal clear on what students should know and be able to do, and what it will look like when they know it. Clearly communicating about this allows our teachers to respond when teachers need enrichment and when students need support. So another factor I mentioned is enhanced teacher learning. In this case, I want to talk about sharing. So take a look at this cartoon. And I know it's really small, so I'll read it to you in case you're not close to it. I know we've got a billion screens, but are you going to share your bag of tricks or not? See, for the longest time, schools function like a set of autonomous franchises. Teachers were given a set of students, a set of materials. They took them all to a room, closed the door, and did their work. The power of PLC is that we work together, not on our own. We use our collaborative time to discuss what works with our kids and share our bag of tricks. Here's an example of a section of an instructional planning sheet. You can see that this PLC team has captured what instruction worked well, what to avoid next year, and notes on students of concern. And students of concern, remember we have four questions. What do we do if they didn't learn? And what do we do if they already know it? So students of concern can also mean students we need to enrich. This is a powerful set of information that significantly enhances teacher learning. Another way that we enhance student learning is through instructional coaching. In Center Grove, we also have the benefit of instructional coaches available in every building. With a word on the power of coaching, I'd like to share this short video from Atul Gawande. And we'll see that video soon. 
but soon, but now we'll watch it all go on. We have two very different ways that we think education happens for adult learners. Uh, one concept is that you go to school, you learn everything, and then you're released into the world. You are now responsible for the rest of your education. And then there's the sports version, which says, you know what, you're never going to learn unless you have a coach all the way. And what I realized, I was in the midpoint in my career, that um, I had kind of plateaued. And what I wondered was what would it be um, to bring a coach into my operating room. And so we, I brought a, one of my colleagues into the operating room who would watch me and tell me what I was doing well, what I wasn't do well, doing well. And it was amazing the things I hadn't recognized I was doing. I wasn't using the lights well. I hadn't set up the field as well as I could have. That there were these little things that um, he saw from his own experience that helped me understand. The biggest criticism has been that I wasn't really effective at listening. And it actually played through and I realized in my own patient conversations. I was talking 90% of the time and it's because I wasn't asking enough questions. And then I carried it over to looking at how I was with my own team and I was doing 90% of the talking. I'm working on getting it below 50%. <laughs> I'm there with my patients. I'm hopefully almost there with the team too. <laughs> so if you will, please turn to a neighbor or someone who's close to you, maybe meet a new friend tonight or talk to the people that you came with and tell them one thing that you heard in that video that surprised you. And when you've had a chance to share, if you just look back up here, then I'll know you're ready. I see a few people looking back at me. Thank you for playing my teacher game. And thank you for participating in that. I wonder if any of you had, any of you had comments that sounded something like this. I was surprised that a surgeon of that apparent caliber was humble enough to ask for help to get better. When you hear it that way, it just makes sense that professionals would seek out and work with coaches. And I am so proud that this community has supported teachers by providing instructional coaches. And I think you'll have to advance it for me because once we go to a video, then it plays, doesn't always play nice, nice. Thank you. So I want you to know that the use of our coaches goes beyond individual teachers. It includes our PLC teams. And if you will, listen to Melanie Apgar. She describes how her second grade PLC team at Center Grove Elementary partnered with their instructional coach for student success. We have a PLC celebration of using high yield strategies through our RTI process and during our math. And to do that, we worked with our instructional coach in the mornings through optional PD. And in our optional professional development time, we learned different strategies we could use with our kids, either that be our kids who were in reach or our kids who needed small group interventions. Our instructional coach took us through different strategies that we could use for our kids. And we practiced those with our colleagues. And then we came back to our classroom and we decided what teacher needed to do what strategy with what group of students. This is how we grouped our students. We took a pretest, and from that pretest, we decided what kids missed what type of question and what they needed as an intervention. So then we went in our professional development in the mornings, we decided what intervention went well with which strategy, and then that's how we divided them up. So I, I don't know about you, but every time I hear that, it gives me goosebumps because I think about the learning that's going on for our kids in this district. And I think I'm gonna, oh, I did, I could do it on my own this time. So there is one more factor that I mentioned impacts the capacity of our learning communities. And that is collective ownership and intelligence. Remember when I described the teaching environment where teachers took their kids into a room and worked on their own? When PLCs are in place, the opposite is true. DeFore says a PLC 
is composed of collaborative teams whose members work interdependently to achieve common goals linked to the purpose of learning for all. Instead of teachers talking about my kids and your kids, you'll hear teachers say, our kids. In this video, Jennifer Fields from Pleasant Grove Elementary, grade five PLC, describes this collective ownership better than I can, so let's watch. Last year um, here at Pleasant Grove, we our focus was um, collaboration, and um, it's amazing how when you work with the same people every day um, in teaching, you don't have time to really sit down and collaborate with one another. So that was very powerful for us. To um, there's five of us on the fifth grade team here, and um, for us to sit and really brainstorm and you know put our heads together and come up with some um, strategies and. Um, instructional way, different ways to teach. Um, it was it was very very powerful and meaningful for the kids. Instead of me being in charge of 30 kids, I now have 150 kids throughout the grade level. We kind of take ownership of the whole grade level rather than just our students, and so that um, is a, is a big paradigm shift. I think we all have our uh, strengths and weaknesses, and we help each other out, and um, everybody's on board, and the kids are going to benefit. Did you hear her say our kids? And I have 150 kids, and she smiled when she said 150 kids, right? So these uh, changes haven't happened. Thank you so much for advancing it. These changes haven't happened overnight. We've been on this journey for the last three years. And so um, we began our journey to becoming a wildly successful PLC in 2016-17. And in that first year, we dedicated time and our um, PLC teams collaborated using the four questions of the PLC that I talked about. The next year we refined our documentation and we refined our processes a little bit more um, and we began capturing our plans and information about student learning on what we call the instructional planning sheet. I showed you a snippet of it earlier. The next year and this year, I should say, we've continued that refining process, but because we're a learning team, our plans are always responding to where are we now. So that's why we're in that, we stayed in that same kind of pattern and just refined. We realized we needed to stay there a little bit longer. And in the future, we expect that we'll be um, enhancing our time, spending even more time focusing on uh, student and teacher learning. So to close out this segment on professional learning communities, I wanted to anchor our work in our vision. In Center Grove, our vision is that all students receive an exceptional educational experience. It doesn't say good, it doesn't say great, it says exceptional. So why are we on this journey? You might ask, we're on this journey to become a wildly successful PLC because PLCs ensure our vision can be our reality. I want to thank you for your attention during this segment, and at this point, I'd like to invite Mrs. Shaw Stack up to talk about Guaranteed and Viable. Thank you. All right. So um, Shannon talked a lot about PLCs and how that is a foundational element of our vision that all students receive an exceptional educational experience. Um, another foundational element that our um, teams and teachers have been working on is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And I'm going to get to what that exactly means here in this segment. But to start, um, I want to talk a little bit about some numbers and to give you kind of the enormity of our teachers' jobs these days. Um, they arguably have the hardest um, era to teach within. There are um, state, there's state accountability, federal accountability, local accountability. There is standardized testing that seems to change quite a bit. Um, there are policies and regulations and just the sheer amount of content that teachers have to teach. So day in and day out, they, um, they are truly rock stars. Um, so we're gonna do a quick little dem um, activity to demonstrate this with your whiteboards. So you, it looks like you all picked one up. 
So the numbers that we're going to guess, this is a guess the numbers game, don't worry, not too much math involved here. Um, so I won't make you do too much thinking this late in the evening. But um, the numbers that I'm using aren't just something I generated. These numbers come from an education researcher named Dr. Bob Marzano. And he has analyzed state and national standards to come up with these numbers. So um, there's no wrong answer. These are all just um, your best guesses. So um, speaking of our rock stars, how many state standards do you think are in an average grade level or course that the state has set out? Go ahead and write down a number on your board and just hold it up. How many? An, um, think of like third grade. The whole year. The whole year. Yep, the whole year. How many standards does a student have to master and a teacher have to teach in, say, a third or fourth grade classroom? Just think of one classroom and hold up your paddles. Let's see. I see 48, 23. We span. I see 50, 350, 25, 1,500. Yeah, we've got a good range here. <laughs> well, it's somewhere in the middle of those, um, about 200. 200 state standards that a student has to master, truly learn, and a teacher has to teach effectively, okay? There are three of these, so next one. Number of benchmarks. So within that standard, the standard sometimes is like three sentences long, and there are multiple things a student has to do within those benchmark, within those standards. So it's gonna be more than 200. Give a best guess. How many benchmarks does a student have to meet within those standards? So how many different targets are within those in a one grade level for the year. Okay, I see 500, I see 1,000, I see 750, 1,000, Bob, $1, 1,100. <laughs> All right, you guys, are, you guys are pretty close. 3,093. So one student is estimated to have to master three over 3,000 little um, within those standards, those benchmarks. Last one. Yeah, do you want me to clarify? So what he did is he looked at both state and national standards. So Indiana has their own set, but he kind of analyzed across the nation. So we didn't analyze our Indiana ones, but he has the research out there for a good national study. Correct, correct. The last one, so in, with that, those two numbers, how many years do you think we would need to adequately cover or teach effectively these benchmarks and standards? How many years would we need? Right now we're K-12, right? So we have 13 years. How many years do you think we would need to effectively teach all of these standards? I'm seeing a lot of 20s, 22, 25, 20, 18, 13. You guys are right on. We would need 23 years in his research with teacher um, experience and to really be able to effectively teach 3,000 benchmarks and 200 standards. So what does this mean besides having an exhausted teaching staff? Um, it means a couple of things, but we are going to do a quick other activity to demonstrate what it means. At your seats, there is a little um, segment of our math standards in fifth grade. So you have the measurement section of the math standards in fifth grade. So here's the scenario. You are a new fifth grade teacher, and you have a three-week unit coming up on measurement and you know you're not gonna be able to have students master all of these measurement standards. So you have to make a judgment call to decide which one is the most important. So I'm gonna give you about two minutes to look through those standards on your own, no looking at your neighbor, no collaborating. You're gonna be an autonomous franchise. Which standard is the most important? What are you going, what are you going to focus on? On your whiteboard, you could just write the, the bold number. That's kind of the shorthand in our state standards. You could just write 5M1 or 5M2, 5M3 when you think you have your most important standard for your unit. Yet whenever you're ready, you can hold it up or you can read through them. You're ready. You've got your standard you want to teach. <laughs> She's the veteran teacher. She's the veteran teacher. There you go. I was going to say, she's seen a state test. <laughs> okay. What do you think is the most important standard?
About 30 more seconds. No right or wrong. Just want you to make a, a call as a new fifth grade teacher. Ah, look at us. I think just a couple more people. Go ahead and hold it up. OK. I see a lot of, you guys are like, I don't know, should this be it? Um, this is, it's a trick question because there's really no right answer. Um, I see a lot of 5M1s. Um, I see some 5M3s. I see 5M4. But if you were a district, your students would be walking away with different mastery. You, your class would be walking away with 5M4 mastered. Your class would be walking away with 5M1. Um, so what does this mean and how, how are we working to collaborate? Um, we have three levels of curriculum at work. Um, when teachers are left um, to make those judgment calls day in and day out, it's exhausting. Um, and it also does this with the curriculum. There are three different levels at any time working. We have an intended curriculum, which means this is what we want students to learn. There's an implemented curriculum, which is what actually gets taught. And then there's an attained curriculum, what the students actually learn. So when we're making individual judgment calls on what to focus on and what to omit, it's really difficult um, for subsequent teachers to know that class had 5M1, so they're, they're mastered, because not all of the classes had 5M1 mastered. Um, so sometimes our curriculum overlap when teachers are left to judgment calls like you just did. Um, so how do we help teachers in this predicament um, with this huge um, task? What we are working on um, is a guaranteed and viable curriculum. So let me get to my right spot here. We are working to align the three different curriculum. So the curricula intended, implemented, and attained, the more they align and match what we want to teach, what actually gets taught, and what students learn, the closer they align, um, the closer we are to a guaranteed and viable curriculum. So what is that phrase? What does that really mean? Guaranteed means that every student has an opportunity to learn specific content in any course or subject, regardless of the teacher. Viable means there's time to learn. So the number of standards is manageable for students to learn and for teachers to teach to mastery, for students to really get into the content and learn it. So that's the, those are, that's the two pronged part of guaranteed and viable. So how do we create this? How do we create a guaranteed and viable curriculum? One of the big tenets um, and cornerstones of a guaranteed and viable curriculum is what we call essential learnings. So we have teams of teachers, if you think back to the math activity that you did, we have teams of teachers from every building come together to talk about the standards. And we have some criteria that's been researched um, that we hand to them and give to them for them to choose, and we look at our state tests, for them to choose what are our power standards or our learning targets or our essential learnings. What are the most important pieces of those measurement standards? What is the most important part of computation? Um, so it's created by teachers, and those essential learnings articulate skills and content and concepts um, that will be attained by all students. And the product that teachers um, would create in that type of a meeting, we call them the collaborator meetings, curriculum collaborator meetings, um, is a fifth grade math example. Can you click that link? Since you were looking at fifth grade math, I did not check, by the way, to see if your 5M1 was, a, was an essential learning. So our teachers follow this type of a guide. This is what we call a quarter view. So you can see in quarter one, the guaranteed and viable essential learnings are number sense, decimal addition and subtraction, whole number multiplication, and whole number division. And teams will um, talk about these in places like a PLC, in their teams, in their collaboration. So that would be the product of some of the guaranteed and viable curriculum work. All right, if you could go back out to the presentation. So overall, that in a nutshell is guaranteed and viable curriculum. It really promotes clarity and consistent priorities for student learning. Pacing for assessments, it helps to tighten up um, what we're expecting and getting crystal clear on, like Mrs. Carol Fry 
um, mentioned, what it, does it look like when students really master that? And it creates ownership of the curriculum. Our teachers are the ones designing and creating these essential learnings and guaranteed and viable curriculum. I think with that, I get to introduce Jesse Hyde from Sugar Grove to talk, um, switching gears a little bit to talk about trust-based relational intervention. Thank you. So I get the honor of talking about TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention. Um, this is what we have adopted as a district to meet the social and emotional needs of our students. We've just shared with you um, what we do for curriculum and really making sure that our students um, are regulated and ready to learn is the foundation of everything we're doing with our curriculum. So um, what is TBRI? It's a trauma-informed approach to meeting the social-emotional needs of our kids. You may have heard of trauma-informed um, approaches or initiatives on the news. It's kind of been a buzzword lately. And really all that means is that we are learning more about our brains and how we work and how that then translates to our behavior. So um, we've gone through training. It's a two uh, two full day training and we've learned a lot about how from the time you are born um, to the time you are an adult how your brain is formed and how that then translates bless you <laughs> I knew there was one more bless you um, how that then translates to how we operate so how do we stay regulated throughout the day um, is part of that so trauma-informed approach um, we want to make sure that our students feel safe when they come to school that felt safety is really again that foundation to making sure that you feel comfortable and ready to learn um, so we are prioritizing that i know trauma-informed makes it seem like it is meant for a specific set of students it's not um, whether your child has experienced trauma in one sense or another and trauma is a very broad term so that could be um, something that happened at birth, that could be environmental trauma. There's a wide range of things that fall under that category. Um, so trauma-informed makes it seem like it is meant specifically just for those kids, but it is very beneficial for all students. Um, I've obviously used it in schools. Um, I was at Pleasant Grove last year and at Sugar Grove this year and used it with very um, various students there. We also use it in our own home and um, have found it beneficial for our kids too. So what is TBRI? It's attachment-based trauma-informed approach to meeting the complex needs of vulnerable children. And again, that term vulnerable um, is really directed at one set, but we use, utilize it for all students. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit more information here in this video, Stacy, if you wouldn't mind sharing. TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention, has at its core building a trusting relationship. It has three sets of principles and they look at the child as a whole. When you think about development, the baby cries and I say, yes, I will comfort you. And so this child learns that they have a voice. They learn trust, which is the lesson of the first year of life. I can trust. There are so many children from hard places and for those children, their capacity to trust has been fiercely damaged. The brain chemistry of a child who cries and no one comes is dramatically altered. The child with a history of trauma or loss or abuse has no hope of healing without a nurturing relationship. In every way that I make time and space, that I give touch, eye contact, and I give words, I am going to empower this child to go back to the beginning of what he or she should have experienced in the arms of a loving parent that said, when you cry, I will come. The phenomenal thing about a trust-based intervention is, as we connect to this child, as we build safety, we actually change the brain chemistry. We change the wiring of the brain. This is really the heart and soul of all that we are and all that we do. Do I look into the child's eyes? Do I touch their arm when I talk to them? When they talk to me, do I stop what I'm doing and talk to them? This is the essence of mindfulness. The excitatory chemicals about, I'm afraid, I'm hungry, I'm cold, those are balanced when the caregiver comes and gives warmth. All regulation occurs first with an external regulator. So in the beginning, I regulate all. They're cold, I bring warmth. They're crying, I bring myself. And out of my regulation, their brain develops capacity for self-regulation. If this child didn't have this experience, that child doesn't feel safe. This chemistry can be altered 
First, by knowing they're safe. Second, by nutrient-rich foods. Third, by my environmental regulation of that child's emotion. And fourth, by appropriate exercise. So we can balance brain chemistry by creating a holistic environment. We clearly have to deal with behavior. Correcting means showing a child the right behavior, praising him when he gets it, and showing it to him until he can get it right, and showing him with no fear and no shame, so that he builds success, not a greater sense of failure. So the message of hope for our families is that we can help our children to dramatic levels of healing. We simply have to be devoted to it and be willing to invest what it's going to take. So TBRI was initially created to help families that had um, foster and adopted um, children. And as they saw success in what they were doing with those kids, it started to transfer into schools. Um, because obviously a lot of a child's day is spent with their teachers. And so we want to make sure our teachers um, have the skill set to be able to handle whatever walks, um, whatever kind of emotions walk into their classroom that day. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, like I said, we've uh, gone through our first phase of training, which is our elementary schools. So um, our pre-K um, through fifth grade teachers and support staff went through training over the summer, and we just finished up our last few trainings in September. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go through some of the key components of what they've learned during that time. So. Obviously, the brain research was a large part of that, so understanding um, why we all act the way we act, um, kids and adults, our reaction is a very important piece of um, our relationship and um, um, interactions with our students. So some key components, connection and relationship with the trusted adult is the most important component to that foundation. So um, all of our teachers have some intentional strategies and ways now that they connect with students. So um, that may be a morning meeting that they're doing in their classroom. A piece of TBRI that we learned in the training is called Nurture Group. Um, and that's a very direct way that teachers build relationships, not only with themselves with the students, but with all the students in the class. And I'm gonna show you a very short snippet um, of what Nurture Group is, and I'm gonna give you some data on um, the results that we've seen from that later. Um, <clears throat> that felt safety is very important and, and they touched on that in the video as well. So if you walk into a scenario as an adult, maybe you don't like large crowds and you walk into a really large crowded area, you might already be a little bit tense or uncomfortable. Some of our students walk into our classrooms feeling that way. Um, and so we need to make sure that every student that walks into our building knows that they are safe and that we value them and we're here to take care of them. So establishing that as part of that relationship piece. <clears throat> um, we talk a lot about self-regulation. So um, as adults, we all have our own little methods if we're nervous or upset of ways to calm ourselves down. Our kids don't naturally have those strategies. So unless their parents are teaching them, which a lot are, um, they may not have those. So we need to help and use that as part of our instruction as well. So we um, teach specific strategies to keep themselves regulated throughout the day. Part of that is addressing students' physiological needs. So they touched on that in the video as well. Um, having w access to water or a snack during the day um, is another um, piece of that regulation. So what does this look like in the classroom? <clears throat> what does this mean for your child? So again, students are intentionally taught self-regulation strategies. So um, we have a, a list um, that we use of several different breathing um, techniques. So your child might come home and show you a hand br breathing strategy they've learned or a breathing box. Um, are a couple that we've taught movement strategies. So um, if a child, there was a fifth grade girl last year that I remember saying, I used my chair purses during ice step because I was really nervous. So we've taught them, you know, things that aren't um, disruptive, but if you're sitting in a chair, you can push down on your chair or pull up on your chair. Um, <clears throat> and that can help calm you down if you're anxious or um, nervous about something or frustrated. Um, calming strategies, again, we have some sensory things in our building, so um, sometimes it's a weighted tool that they might put on their lap. Um, maybe it's a, a fidget tool that they use in their hands to keep themselves calm. So um, several different strategies, and this, there's not one strategy, strategy that fits every student. We teach them different ones so then they can find out what works for them. <clears throat> 
as part of that self-regulation, we talk about an engine, and I'm gonna show you some visuals of that later. So if your child has come home and talked about um, their engine being in the red, green, or blue, those are the three colors that we've taught. So green is, um, I feel good, I'm calm, and I'm ready to learn. If they move into the blue, um, that could mean that they're tired or sad. Um, that's kind of the low color. And then if they're in the red, they might be um, frustrated, angry, hyper, um, anxious. Any of those um, elevated levels would be in the red. And so we teach, okay, this is what it feels like to be in the blue. And here are direct strategies if you're in the blue to help you get back to that green zone. Same thing with the red. Here's what it feels like to be in the red zone. Here's what might be happening inside your body, and here are ways to get you back to the green so you're ready to learn again. So we're just very intentional with those um, strategies and, and emotions. Um, <clears throat> again, we might offer students snacks and water throughout the day to help keep them regulated. Um, and that connection time is really important. I know that our teachers um, are putting a lot of effort into making sure that each student feels that they are valued by them. So a few pictures from um, some classrooms. Many teachers have calming corners. So you can see a small picture there of the engine and then some strategies are listed there as well. So if a student needs a break within the classroom, they can go back there and use those tools. The middle picture is another calming corner. There are different things in there, some um, moon sand, some um, stress balls, um, water beads or bees that they can run their hands through. So different things um, that teachers have put into their classrooms. <clears throat> we have um, some common language that you might hear from your children. Um, the poster on the right hand side that has the buckets all around it have the three terms that we use in nurture group. So if your child's teacher does nurture group or they might just utilize this language, these are the three things that you'll hear. So we teach stick together, which basically means respect. <clears throat> if you're talking, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna follow along with my classmates and my teachers. Um, the second one is no hurts, and we talk about that being internal or external, so um, not hurting one another's feelings, but also physically not hurting one another. And then if we stick together and have no hurts, we should have fun at school, so that's the third piece to that. So it's just a visual of those terms. We have a lot of common language that we're using. <clears throat> those TBR li TBRI life terms that you see in that first picture, again, that's common language that we now can all use across the board. Um, being gentle and, gentle and kind, um, talking to one another with respect. These are key phrases that we're teaching our children. What do they mean <clears throat> and how do we use them? Again, those are a couple um, engine examples. That middle picture has what you might be feeling if you're in the blue and how you, what you can do to stay regulated. And same thing with the green and the red. And that picture over on the right-hand side is just a, a classroom table. Each individual student has an engine next to their name. Um, and a lot of teachers are using that, okay, what color are you in? I can tell you might need something right now. How can I help you? <clears throat> and then water bottles at the tables just to keep students regulated again throughout the day. So what are the results? This is our first year of full implementation across our district. Last year, um, Pleasant Grove had about 20 staff members that were trained and utilized this throughout the school year. So that was kind of our pilot for the district to see how things were going to work. <clears throat> the nurture group piece that I talked about earlier is a 30 minute structure um, that you can use in a whole classroom. So teachers might do it with their whole class. We also have students that might need some additional support that would get pulled out um, and work maybe with the counselor or an administrator on, um, thank you, on um, some strategy. So the basics of nurture group is you go over the rules, the three that we talked about, stick together, no hurts, have fun. You do some sort of sharing, so that's that community building. The teacher might ask a simple question, what's your favorite thing to do when you get home? It could be something a little bit deeper, what's something you're really proud of or something that makes you nervous? And so that's just a sharing connection time. <clears throat> then they do some caring for one another, so um, practice taking care of a neighbor and letting a neighbor take care of you. They also do a skill practice, so that might be what does it look like to show respect to your teacher? What does it look like to show respect to a friend? How do you, how do you offer a compromise to a friend when you guys aren't getting along? How do you come to an agreement? <clears throat> and I learned through running several nurture groups myself last year that what really changes behavior in students is practicing a skill. Every time a student comes to the office, they can tell you what they should have done and how they should have done it 
but they're not doing it. Why? They're not practicing it. And if they've never had a, a conversation about compromising with somebody, they don't really know how to do it. They can tell you, but they don't know how. So that practice piece is very important. So we had a small group of students um, that were struggling to stay regulated throughout the day. They were students that we saw frequently in the office last year. And so we pulled those students and, and did um, consistent nurture group with them to see what those results would be. So I'm gonna show you some of the data from that group. Um, crisis calls, that is a term that we use Excuse me, when we have students who are having significant enough behaviors that they need to be removed from the classroom. And so um, <clears throat> we saw a 67 decrease, 67% uh, decrease in crisis calls for that group of students over six weeks. So we continued after six weeks, but six weeks is kind of where we looked at our first data point. Um, and in that short time, we saw a 67% decrease in the amount of calls that we had. Um, we also saw a decrease in the length of time that they needed to be removed from a classroom. So these were kids that struggled to stay regulated. <clears throat> so initially, when we first started group, we were needed to go down, remove the student, and help them get regulated. Um, after a couple of weeks, they would come with us we would kind of co-regulate next to them. So let me show you some options. You try and see what works for you. After six weeks, when we were getting calls, the calls that we were getting, those students would be able to come down and say, okay, I know I need this, this, or this um, to get myself regulated. And they would be able to self-regulate. And we got to the point where they were able to do those things in class. So some of those strategies that I talked about. So they're not disrupting others and they're not losing out instructional time themselves because they are able to keep themselves regulated throughout the day. So we did see very positive um, results from that. And again, that was a small group, um, but several of those strategies teachers across the school were using. So now that we have um, <clears throat> teachers across all of our schools, we can look at some more um, big picture data this year as we continue to go. But obviously we were very pleased with what we saw um, initially. So to wrap up here, I have a video that has some firsthand examples from some Pleasant Grove staff and students <clears throat> since they had implemented this last year. I have a couple of teachers talking about um, the benefits that they saw as a classroom teacher. We have some fifth grade teachers that share um, what they used in their classroom and how that helped them. And then we also have um, a kindergarten teacher who um, is, it's just her with her students, and you're gonna see how she incorporates some of those self-regulation strategies, and you'll see the very beginning part of Nurture Group where she kind of goes over the rules with them. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about TBRI and how we've been able to use it in our classrooms this year. Um, one of the most beneficial things that we've both done um, is to help students create um, little visuals so that they can learn to check their engine. And we talked about this at the beginning of the year, um, really helping students to get in the green so that they're just right and ready to learn. Um, and we talked about what it looks like to be in the red um, or in the blue. Um, then we gave kids strategies so that if they are in the red or if they are in the blue, um, they can do things to help them get in the green. And we really introduced this at the beginning of the year, but we've been referring to it throughout the year, and it's just been neat to see the kids, um, without direction from us, go ahead and do some of these strategies, such as the breathing box, um, the birthday candles, chair pushes, um, and we just see kids do this on their own without direction from us. So they really are learning to regulate themselves and get them in a position where they're ready to learn. And then it just helps them to have more self-control and to take ownership of if they are feeling like they are ready to learn and ready to um, to go. The other thing that we've done in our classrooms um, from time to time is have nurture groups as well and that's where the kids sit in a circle and we practice giving care to one another and receiving care and kind of talking about that as well. Um, what I've seen in my classroom is right after we have a nurture group um, the, the atmosphere of my classroom changes where the students are definitely more concerned about each other and their learning where I find that they're more concerned about helping each other um, whether it be like on math problems or something like that um, they just seem more um, like they are genuinely 
um, wanting to help others. Let's go over our rules. Our first rule is we are sitting together. So the only person talking is the person with the sunshine today, and that's where your eyes and ears should be. We're being respectful of one another. And our second rule is no words. That's on the outside, so make sure you have your personal space, hands and feet to yourself. And on the inside, we also want to use kind words. That's all part of also being respectful. We want everyone to feel important and not invisible, so we're gonna make sure we're showing our good eyes. All right, um, and when we stick together with no hurts, we will have fun! All right, today we are gonna share something that makes us feel scared. I want you to think of something about what makes you scared. So you've been sitting for a little bit, so let's do something to get ourselves regulated. I'm going to let you choose um, a breathing strategy today, and if you have some new one, you don't have to tell me a new. You can just show me. I'm going to watch all of you, okay? We're going to take about 10 seconds, and we're going to get ourselves in the green. Um, knowing that, you know, I envision my own children in a classroom like that, and that's exactly the type of environment um, that I would love for my children to be in. So that's very encouraging. Um, as Jesse talked about, we started with a pilot program at Pleasant Grove Elementary um, last year and immediately started seeing positive results from TBRI. Um, as a district, our administrative team um, was, we were collaborating very heavily with Jesse, trying to figure out, you know, what, what did you get yourself into and how can we um, expand that into more of our schools? So with that, we decided to expand TBRI into our elementary buildings. Um, what that looks like for our staff, um, and Jesse talked a little bit about this, it is a two-day um, training, and it's an extensive two-day training. Um, it's a, a very um, heavy training that you go through. You learn about yourself, you learn about your students, um, and learn about how you can support them more. So school staff goes through that. Um, the training focuses on the three principles within TBRI. So um, the connecting, empowering, and correcting principles. Um, and those were discussed in that video, but um, primarily focusing on how do we build relationships with our students, how do we give them a voice, and how do we help them regulate within the classroom. Um, aside from the extensive two-day training that our staff went through, um, they also have ongoing support from program support teachers that are hired within Center Grove, um, who are out in our buildings working on a daily basis with our teachers um, to continue those efforts. And then Amy Abel is the TBRI trainer um, that we have been working with, and she also provides consultation um, three times a year with our buildings. So um, unlike many trainings that we go to and we get very excited and we learn all this new information and we come back and then we don't really know where to go from here, I, you know, maybe I implement a little bit of it and I hit, you know, a little road bump. Um, and I don't know what to do in my classroom, Amy is coming into our buildings to help our teachers work through those um, and to continue to implement strategies. So with that, um, we started in May of this last year and we currently have 415 staff members that have been trained in TBRI um, through, we just wrapped up at the end of September. Um, our primary focus for what we're referring to as phase one was in our elementary buildings. Um, we also had all of our administrators, uh, many of our counselors and special education teachers 
um, and also our school-based adult and child therapists who are working in our buildings on a daily basis um, were trained. Phase two is what we're getting ready to enter right now, um, and we're having ongoing discussions with our teachers, with our administrators, with our school board, um, to discuss how we want this to look in our secondary buildings. We've learned from Pleasant Grove and from the work that we've done so far that these strategies are working. Um, it's very good information for our teachers to have um, and to empower our students to be able to take these strategies um, on with them for the rest of their lives. So uh, we are currently working through the details of that and how we can implement um, these strategies into our secondary buildings. And a, a third component to this, um, we've realized um, as with anything, any academic piece, anything that goes into a child's education, we cannot do it alone. Um, this is incredibly powerful information. Going through it as an educator, um, I also went through this training with the lens of a parent, um, and it has completely changed how I parent my children. Um, I know many of our teachers who have gone through, you know, said immediately I left, and I started implementing strategies the next day with my children. So um, with that, we wanted to be able to provide an opportunity for parents to go through this training. Um, with Amy Abel, who is the consultant that we are working with. Um, so we are excited to be able to offer all of you um, a two-part parent training. Um, it will take place on November 28th and December 5th, and we do ask that you attend both sessions if you're interested. Um, they will build on one another, so if you attend on the 28th um, and don't come back on the 5th, you'll miss kind of that second piece. Um, they will take place from 6.30 to 8.30 in the evening at Middle School North. Um, this is going to provide an in-depth look into TBRI. You guys have gotten a really quick snapshot tonight um, to kind of give you more information about what it is. But the goal is for you as parents to gain a better understanding of TBRI and how you can implement strategies at home. Um, I think what you guys saw from some of those videos this, is, this applies to every single child. If you know, my child is um, worked up, they're frustrated with something, I want them to be able to communicate that need, to you know, do some box breathing, whatever they need to do to, to get back um, to a regulated state so they can communicate with us. So we wanna give you guys those tools to help support your children in your home. Um, this is structured to build from one night to another, again, so that attendance at both is highly encouraged. Um, due to the nature of this training, um, it is a small, it works better in a very small group um, as opposed to more of a, um, an auditorium type training. So we will have um, limited seating available. Um, we are also expecting to be able to provide dinner. So if you would like to bring your family to the training um, and have dinner with us, and we will also have childcare available on site that you can take advantage of. So um, we highly encourage anyone that's interested, um, as you know, Jesse talked about, this is good for all kids. It's, it's great information and great strategies to have. So I encourage you to go to our school website and then forward slash TBRI. Um, and we will have a registration link on that web page um, that you can register to attend the training. Okay, and with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Brecker. Thank you so much. Um, and we're doing a lot of exciting work. Our teachers are learning and growing, and that's only helping our students to, to learn and grow because that's what we're about. We're about our students. And um, we do have two more meetings, and you'll see, I'll leave this up for just a bit. You'll see that feedback um, Google form, it's a survey. If you wanna put in your um, search browser, goo.gl slash 6hrxsg, yeah, that's a shortened one, I know it's silly, but um, you're welcome to provide feedback or ask questions that way. We are happy to get back with you if you want. Again, we will also stay after. Um, we finished, and we, we thought we had finished early. Um, we finished a bit early, so we're happy to stay and answer your questions. You must have you know, several things swirling around in your minds. If you don't have time to ask now, don't hesitate to ask via the form. Um, provide your email address and we'll get back to you. And um, if you want to even have a conversation, we'll happily um, give you a phone call. Our next parent meeting is on December the 4th, the same location, um, and that is gonna be um, proficiency scales. 
um, that part of the guaranteed and viable <coughs> curriculum that measures that learning progression so we know exactly what we need to do with each and every student. Um, and then meeting three is we're going to spend more time talking about assessment and give you a TBRI, excuse me, TBRI update from our work throughout the year um, that far, up to that point. Um, so that's going to be on March the 11th, and again, that's in the same place. So I'll say thanks, but I'll go back to this in case you want to see the um, shortened URL for our feedback form. And with that, um, I will give you one final thank you so much for spending your time um, learning more about what we're working on together in our journey um, to provide exceptional educational experiences to all of our students. Have a good evening.